you must be tracking state and you and you should have been tracking it yesterday. Why it is you absolutely must be tracking state effective yesterday, effective five years ago, take zero. All right. So as part of this 12 days of MES for Christmas, this idea Zach came up with, we're shooting content on um, MES and to help lay the foundation for the MES bootcamp accelerator, uh, which starts in January. So that we're going to be redoing the bootcamp we did a couple of years ago, and we're doing an accelerator with it in January and February. Uh, if you want to check that out, you can go to iot.university or click in the link. I'm not sure where that'll be. But I get this question all the time. Um, what's the most important part of MES? Where's the place you must start? Blah, blah, blah. The answer is state tracking. So in this video, I'm going to go over that real quick, why you must be doing it. If, they, they're, if there's so many of the KPIs that come out of manufacturing execution, KPIs are used for decision making, right? Key performance indicators, use them to make decisions to optimize efficiency, improve processes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So many of those KPIs involve, they use the, the transitions of state in your assets to inform you, okay? There are four primary uh, inputs that you need for manufacturing execution. There are other ones, there are, there are many others, but there are four absolutely critical ones. You need in-feed on every asset, that is raw material going in. You need out-feed, finished goods going out or work in progress going out. You need waste and you need state. If you wanna calculate mean time to repair, mean time between failure, you wanna track downtime, um, if you want to look at a Pareto for your top 10 downtime reasons, all those KPIs, uh, OEE, TEEP, they all require that you stack uh, track state, okay? I'm going to quickly go through what does that look like, okay? For those of you who, actually, for those of you who, even, who currently even do it, okay? Um, all right, so let's take a look here. When you start out with an asset where you're not currently tracking state, you, you, you're going to have something like here on the left. You're going to have a programmable logic controller. You're going to have a PLC. In this case, we're looking at a Cymatic uh, uh, Siemens S7-1500. We've got, I've got some control logics examples down below. doesn't matter what PLC. doesn't matter what embedded controller. You have inputs and outputs okay, on that, in the, on that controller. State comes from primarily the inputs. It does occasionally. You, you may be able to create state from an output. An input is a physical wiring that goes out to devices in the field. And when contacts close or open or when analog values change, uh, there is an electrical signal that goes into the input that the program can can read. OK, um, in this case, uh, uh, three examples of in physical inputs that come from the field that we might use in tracking state. Uh, we might have a physical input zero. That's from our e-stop. We might have a physical input one that's from our contactor. That is a motor cont contactor. I push the start button. The motor starts. Physical contactor closes, and we get an auxiliary contact coming back telling us that the contactor is closed and we're actually moving. Uh, input two might come from a tack. It may come from a. It may be an analog value that's measuring the speed on a conveyor, for example, telling us the state is we're running. Uh, we also have internal inputs. Okay, so internal zero might be an alarm. OK, that is it doesn't come from physical wiring, but it comes from programmable logic. So what we might do is we might take the inputs from physical switches uh, in the field. OK, so that's a physical input card zero input zero, physical input card zero input one, physical input card zero input three, physical input card zero input two, four, five, six and seven. And we may output that to an internal bit, Q0, that is table zero, and then bit zero in that table, where we have an alarm output. So we may have, and, and I, we may have uh, um, memory registers or memory bits inside of the program that we could monitor to create state. And then the last thing is we might have human inputs that create state. We take those three elements, we use physical, we use internal, and we use human, and then we use program, we use logic to create state tracking, okay? And it generally is gonna look like this. We're gonna try and create a state register, okay? So that is a one value, one register, 
that is going to give us a value. It's always going to show a value. It may show zero. It may show one. It may show two. It may show three. It may, sh it may show four. Okay. And what we're going to have is a lookup table where if the value is zero, if the register value is zero, then that's going to mean that the line is stopped. We're going to take logic. We're going to write logic that's going to use all of these things, physical inputs, human inputs, and internal inputs to create a register that when we have a value, we can look in, we can look in a lookup table and tell what that value means. What is the state of that device? And then we can apply modes or um, we can, we can ap apply a, a mode or a configuration to one of those states. So for example, we can say zero means that it's stopped However, we want, we want to say that the mode or the configuration in this case or the classification is that is downtime, okay? If zero, then it means we're in downtime. If one, it means we're running. If two, when we see a physical e-stop, we want to categorize that as downtime. If we see five, then we want to say that that's in changeover mode, and we're going to say that's planned downtime. And this is for generating our KPIs, this, these classifications are how we will generate our KPIs. We need to know the difference between a state being something that we want to say is this asset is unavailable and, and the, or this asset is something that we have scheduled not to run at this given time. Therefore, we don't want to punish ourselves for the fact it wasn't running, okay, when we're calculating these KPIs. So what we do is we generate a status register using logic. Sometimes that logic is internal to the PLC. We may write ladder logic similar to this that creates a status register coming out. In a perfect world, in your minimum technical requirements, you are sending that specification to your machine builder, and the machine builder is shipping the machine with this register. So they give you, hey, the register is located at uh, Q. That's internal input. It'll be internal input zero, and it'll be at, you know, say five. Uh, actually, let's say uh, 16. So Q016, all right, uh, that would be the second, the beginning of the second word. We would say that is where we're going to read the register. And then they would give us a configuration saying, if you see zero, it means stopped, and we, can, and we categorize that as downtime. They give us a table, okay? In a perfect world, that's happening on the machine builder side. The reality is, is in the vast majority of cases, we are doing this in an IIoT platform or using it, we're doing it in a data ops platform where we're connecting to all these inputs and outputs and human inputs and we're using, say, a tool like HiByte to do this for us or we're using Ignition to do this for us or we're using uh, Tatsos Frameworks or we're using some IIoT platform, WinCCOA, to create the status register for us, okay? What do we do when we have the status register? Once we have the status register, every time it changes, we're going to insert a record into a state history table. This is tracking state. We're going to insert a record into state history table. So we're going to end up with the state and then a start time, and there will be no end time while it's in the current state. And then when it changes, we will insert another record. So then it'll be, we'll say it's one, and then it'll the zero will have a start time and an end time, and the one will have a start time. And as the register changes, we're storing that in the state history table. Then when we want to do, let's say, for example, we want to report on what, we're all, what is all the downtime over the last hour? What is every single event over the last hour and what does it mean? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to query the state history table. We're going to join it against a state reasons table. And we're going to say select all the downtime from this asset. And we're going to join it on the state reason table so that we can say this asset was stopped at the beginning, at this time, at this time, and we're going to coalesce together the distance between start and end to give us a total number of minutes or seconds that it was down. And that's how we, we would generate a table that looks like downtime tracking. Okay. All right. Th that is a quick overview of why tracking state matters and how it's done. We're going to go over this in the boot camp. We're going to do this in the boot camp and the accelerator as Zach takes everybody through the accelerator. But I would say we'll go more into detail there if you have more questions. But what's very, very important to understand, let me say this unequivocally, you must be tracking state 
and you and you should have been tracking it yesterday. E- even if you don't start your digital transformation journey for three more years, trust me, you will want that history and you will want that history on every single asset. Asset is either a sell or a production line. You're going to want to track the history in a perfect scenario. When you start your digital transformation journey, you already have years and years of history of the state transitions. You already have that. I mean, so many things you do with the, with that with that data, especially around machine learning. If you want to do predictive analytics to predict failures, one of the very first things you must be doing is collecting history over time of the state changes. All right, with that, like, subscribe, comment down below, and I will see you in the next one.